pretty tough report on DCYF. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Our Friday programs are generally uh, one guest, one issue, and uh, because we tape them on Thursday, we, we can spread things out. Uh, it's not normally uh, my thing to get a state house conversation going on a Friday evening, but uh, I, I think there's an importance to this DCYF story. I think the role that House Oversight is going to play here will be a significant one. Uh, and I just don't think these are the kinds of things that need to be, you know, put on the shelf as potential learning lessons until they're fully vetted and the public really has an understanding as to what's going on here. Patricia Serpa is the chairperson of the House Oversight Committee and has really been very energetic and really kind of no holds barred, doesn't pull any punches on a whole bunch of things. So there's a handful of issues underneath her uh, jurisdiction or at least her oversight that we should discuss tonight and we shall. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, appreciate it so much. Here's a headline that was driving a lot of the news cycle here this week. Child Advocate Report. It's 57 pages, and it was pretty tough. Here was Eyewitness News uh, story on it. A Warwick mother charged with manslaughter in the death of her nine-year-old adopted daughter, Zanai Rothgeb. But the DCYF Oversight Agency, the Office of the Child Advocate, says there's blame to share. We maintain that the actions or inactions of DCYF staff contributed to the death of this child. I read through the 57-page report that details how Michelle Rothgeb was able to foster or adopt 13 disabled children despite her criminal past, including prison time, and multiple red flags, including an attempt to sell prescription formula online. Nine months after Rothgeb was indicated for child neglect, nine-year-old Zanai was found dead in a bathtub. The girl with cerebral palsy had been left there for hours. The report finds DCYF, with its social workers, supervisors, and administrators, created this situation. Over the course of 13 years, they had multiple opportunities to intervene. Many of the recommendations in the report, DCYF has already implemented. So we share the concerns. DCYF has already taken action. But I expect there'll be more. Do you still have confidence in Director Pacola? I do. I have great confidence in Director Pacola. She has an incredibly difficult job. And uh, no doubt, I mean, listen, DCYF, if it was running at 100% smooth, would have a very difficult job because foster parenting is, is um, a tenuous thing to monitor. Uh, kids without homes are a heartbreak and take a lot of diligence to make sure they're okay. Social realities are difficult these days, right? I mean, so DCYF, even if it was running at 100% efficiency would still be a very difficult project. Welcome, uh, Chairwoman. Thank nice you, to Dan. have you. It's nice to be you here agree again with, me with on you. That? I, I do agree with you, Dan. And before we begin, you know, when I, in this role of House Oversight, I've kind of familiarized myself with bureaucracy. And I don't mean this in any kind of religious sense, but of all the agencies in this state, DCYF is charged with the most sacred mission of taking care of the babies and the children that we take out of their homes because they're allegedly unsafe. It's our job as a state to keep them safe. Once we take these children from their biologicals and keep them safe, and this is what we get. And you're right, Dan, it's been a history plagued with problems under multiple directors, and, and unfortunately, Dr. Pacola is not the new kid on the block anymore. Some of this is on her, too. Okay, so do you... Short answer, do you agree with the governor in expressing full confidence in Dr. Pacola, who runs DCYF right now? I'm disappointed in Dr. Pacola because after I read this report, I understand that she was not entirely honest with the media when she indicated after the little girl died that people, I, she, she cloaked her words carefully, but she did indicate that people who were there at the time were no longer there, and I think the public would surmised from that that they were terminated when in fact the child advocate found out that I think two retired and one took a transfer of their own volition and um, I also learned from the child advocate that she was not forthcoming in 
turning over the records that the child advocate it, it, needed. Explain to, to everybody the, the process here, because when we say house oversight, you don't have, I mean, you have the power of inquiry. You really don't right. have the power of, you don't have the authority to enact, change, discipline. Uh, you can make recommendations. Right. Um, but. Uh, it's you're kind of like uh, the analogy would be you're the mall security guard without the gun, right? Yeah, we don't have a gun. Sometimes right. I wish we do. Well, maybe we shouldn't in in, yeah. in this case for right. tonight. And you're right, we can't. Figuratively, change. I'm talking. Figuratively, that's, I mean, you, you have right. you, know, you wear the uniform, you ask questions, you're going to escort somebody out, but someone else is going to have to charge you. And Dan, if if nothing else, and if we as a committee have to embarrass people into doing their jobs. I'll embarrass them all day long. We're paying for it. They owe it to us. You and I are taxpayers first. We're citizens first. I feel that I have a responsibility. And I said, when the speaker asked me to take this position, I want to have the permission to delve into matters that matter to Rhode Island. And I think the safety of kids matters to all Rhode Islanders, whether you're Libertarian, Democrat, or Republican. And I will continue to shine the light and use this as a bully pulpit, as you've called it in the past, and I think that's perfect. I will use this as a bully pulpit to get it right. The child advocate, you support her. You I do, absolutely, 1,000%. The child advocate, Jennifer Griffith, yeah. is an attorney. Um, she's appointed by the governor for, I think, a six-year term. This might be year four of her six-year term. And she, frankly, answers to no one. She doesn't have it. She comes with, her job comes with no strings attached. And it's her job to protect Rhode Island's children. She'll go to court. She can be removed by the she governor. She can be removed by the governor after the six-year term. She could be reappointed by the governor after the six-year term. What will happen remains to be seen. But what I admire about Jennifer is her willingness to tell the truth. She doesn't care whose toes she steps on. She tells the unbridled truth, good, bad, and ugly. And in this case, it, it's pretty ugly. And I admire for that. But she was smart enough with this new report, which I have not had a chance to to read. I just skim, and uh, I, we'll get to it because it's important reading. It's not the Mueller report. It's it, it's a quicker read than that. But it is. Um, it's collaborative. She was smart enough to bring others into play, right? Right, and she always does. Just just so you know, Jennifer does not do this research on her own. And on page one, and by the way, for your listeners, this page, uh, this report is on the General Assembly website under special reports. She assembles a commission of people, usually retirees, and it's right on page two here. In this case, a retired police officer, um, a retired school superintendent with some expertise in, in special education, maybe a retired DCYF worker, a former foster parent, so that they can collaboratively try to put all of the pieces together to try to figure out what went wrong and what recommendations should come out of this disaster. And this is the disaster of disasters. We thought MTM and UHIP were bad. This is the frosting on the cake tonight. Well, and we've got nothing but acronyms that we have to follow. We'll, we'll, <laughs> right. we'll touch base on UHIP and MTM, which is a volatile situation uh, coming up um, uh, momentarily. The one thing that I was concerned about this week, and I expressed it on the radio on Wednesday, this is Friday's show, uh, you proffered, well you didn't proffer, but you, you wondered out loud whether or not there's criminal liability here for, for DCYF. Do you think that's responsible from a House Oversight position for you to be articulating that 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 wonderment? You know not, what? I, let me just be clear, I don't think it is. You don't think it is? Well, I, I guess criminal is a is a philosophical discussion we could have at another time. There could be criminal liability yep. here. I yep. just don't know that you're the person in chairing House Oversight that should be wondering out loud about that. Well, sometimes open mouth, insert foot. I don't regret that I said it. I think there's certainly enough negligence. Can negligence lead to a criminal outcome? I think it can. Oh, there's no doubt the Attorney General is going to, he, he has already said he's going to take a review of this. Yep. He is the player mm -hmm. uh, to suggest that. I just wonder as you, as you try to uh, get all the facts across the board, whether you prejudice your effort by, by, by stepping into it that far. Well, I said it. I'm not going to reel the words back in. Ultimately, it's not my decision to make, but there's certainly a lot of blame to go around. Then let me make a point here, I, and I want to make this clear. Uh, I, this has nothing to do with what I think the overall performance of the chairperson has been. Your energy, your conviction, your uh, your sincerity, then the energy, I said it twice, I think the energy that you put into this and your desire to get to the bottom of things, I think is pretty stood, it's, it has stood on its own um, Thank you. performance. Thank I just think sometimes we gotta, we got to make sure that the engine doesn't get too hot because then it kind of, I don't know what word I want to use, 
uh, boils over. Well, it well it, it, it tilts mm, I, I the windmill it. of of, of fair adjudication. Uh, and storytelling that I think House Oversight needs to, mm -hmm. needs to make. And you know, Dan, in my own defense, this is an emotional report to read. Mm. And honestly, when I read it, I, my eyes filled up with tears. And at one point, I had to walk away and do something else before I could come back Because it reeks of it. negligence. It's, it's beyond that. I wouldn't treat animals the way these children were treated. All right. When we come back, you know, what next in this process? And there are a couple of other things that Oversight are working on as well. Stay with us. Now, you, uh, the timing of this is interesting. You, again, sometimes we get caught chrono chronologically. The, the chairwoman is here on a Thursday taping for your Friday viewing. You have a hearing scheduled for tonight, which means for your viewing last night. Um, hard to say what would happen in a hearing in advance of it, but you pretty much know what your objective is. Correct. And so um, as we play that chronological calendar game here, what is your mission? Well, so far as I know for tonight, just so you know, Doc. Which is last night. Wh which is right. last night. Don't, go ahead. Just, just <laughs> do your Pecola, thing. Stay um, on your time frame. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Pacola wanted to know if she could go first tonight so that she could um, offer the policies and the procedures that she has implemented since little Zane died in January. And that's fine. I don't know if she thinks doing that will soften the blow of this. I don't think that it will because my members are on fire. Um, and then Jennifer is not going to regurgitate this entire 57-page report to us. She'll go over some highlights. She'll take our questions. And I think there will be many. Um, my goal tonight is to, number one, find out from Jennifer if she's satisfied with the procedures and policies that are in place. Because people are saying, what's the next step? What are you going to do next? And I've spoken to Jennifer. And she said, you know, Pat, the policies and the procedures that they already have in place are fine. She said, we don't need more policy. It's about execution. Proceed. Yeah, she said, it's execution. She said, and people don't follow them. And when they don't follow them, there are no consequences. Talk to me about the discrepancies that, uh, that are articulated in the report. Not only did the uh, director of DCOIF um, massage some of, the, some of the realities with the media in terms of some of the personnel stuff, but it doesn't seem like she was completely free and open and transparent with the child advocates investigation. Are you going to pursue that in your line of questioning? I am concerned about that tonight. Um, Does that mean that the director needs to understand that that you'll make enough noise to question whether her her performance legitimizes her position? I can't pass judgment on her performance. That's up to the governor. But to my way of thinking, when you deliberately hold with information from another government agency that is doing, conducting an investigation, and your information is pertinent to her outcome, and you deliberately withhold it, that's for a reason. Can you resolve as a committee uh, to recommend somebody's hiring or firing? I don't think we can. I suppose. Well, sure you've, you you've heard Representative Williams call for the termination of a contract. Why wouldn't you? Why, why, why couldn't you? I mean, you, you don't have the authority, but you can certainly. I don't know. Have you ever? Has the House Oversight Committee ever resolved anything, meaning created some kind of a document of opinion? Um, we have not done that, Dan. I hadn't really given it any thought. Maybe that's something we, we should consider. But then again, it's going to be another document, and it's going to sit where and what's going to well, happen. I see, well, here's the thing. I, th I think you've done a very effective job as a bully pulpit uh, uh, occupier, as we've discussed. And it seems to me if the House Oversight Committee feels, and I'm not, I'm not lobbying for this uh, th in this particular case because it's so volatile and it's so tragic. Uh, and Dr. Pacola seems to be of a uh, high level competence. Why she hasn't been completely clear and transparent with this investigation, I think, is something that you guys probably have to take a hard look at. But if you're going to have this effect of getting to the bottom of things and storytelling, at least, at the end of the day, if you have a story that you think, whether it doesn't matter whether it's this issue or another, where you think something should be done and the administration is the custodian or the responsible party to get it done, passing a resolution of, of opinion, I think, is something that probably ought to be in your toolbox. 
that's something we could certainly discuss with Mike Egan, my legal counsel. Um, but a resolution doesn't have the effect of law, as you know. No, but it's but it but you know it's one thing. The governor can 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 listen to all this in an echo chamber and say it's over in that chamber. I'm just doing my thing. But headlines that say House Oversight calls for X on any particular matter have an impact on the administration, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Well, I, if you recall back to an MTM hearing, that was the, those are the transportation people, um, when Representative Williams had had it up to her eyebrows, and the next day I think the governor called it political grandstanding. And it's not political grandstanding. Representative Williams lives in one of the poorest districts in the state, and her her constituents utilize these transportation well, since services. We, since, since we jumped into that, why oh. don't we transition to it when we come back? Stay with us. Okay. Gina Raimondo, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. Please fix it. In fact, cancel the doggone contract. That's where I am. Uh, you were, that's what you were alluding to, mm -hmm. Anastasia Williams. So, by the way, I'm just going to say this for the record. I am extremely fond of Anastasia Williams, and I think she of me, but every time I see her, she says, Dan, when are you going to get me on your shows? I'm so sick. And then we call, and I can't find her anywhere. I'll pass the message well, along. Well, you, you just tell her, tell her, tell her, I'm, I'm right here with her. I got you. I got I'll tell her. Come here and tell your she's stories. Great. She's, she's great. She's wonderful. Yep. Um, and by the way, she's good theater. Sometimes too much theater, sometimes the theater has a point to make. And don't underestimate what's going on up there. With no, she's very, she's very smart. Very bright. No, she's very smart. Very bright. I, 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 I've been a fan for a long time. Yep. The, um, the point that you were making, though, about her assertion on this MTM. MTM is a company that is a nationwide company that has a contract with Rhode Island to provide transportation services for... Medicaid patients. Correct. And right? elderly patients. And you don't have to be on Medicaid. You can okay. be on Medicare and still use the service. Gotcha. And they've been late and there's been problems. How did that all surface? Actually, Dan, believe it or not, it surfaced day four of of the start of the legislative session in January. I was getting complaints and I'm saying to myself, well, they kicked off, I think, January 2nd. Here it is, January 6th. Because they're new. They're new. By day four of, of their being employed by the state of Rhode Island, I, we were getting complaints. Was there an uptime transition problem or is this a systemic problem? I think it's a systemic problem. And what is the systemic problem? The systemic problem is that they had no plan and part of the systemic problem belongs to the state. Do you know that we entered into a contract with this company with no program outcome defined before we sign the contract. It says in the contract that uh, program outcomes will be determined at a later date. In what parallel universe does anybody sign a contract without the outcomes being defined? A $115 million contract. Your eyes are bugging out of your head. I see that. In what parallel universe does that happen? So this is what we get. They've made some progress? Not really. No, no, I can't say that they've made progress, no. People have stopped calling, people have stopped using them. Um, I suspect and have strong reason to believe that there's some kind of consequences to the people who have complained. I think that the cab drivers or the providers who have come to House Oversight and complained about their vehicles not being utilized sufficiently. I think they're getting less work because they've been vocal. And these are, the, these are small businesses, Dan. Don't forget that. Some of them have gone so far as to buy vans. What, what have their stories been? They've been, yeah. uh, they, they've been given, they'll say, pick up Dan York, and there's three different addresses for Dan York. So unless they've picked Dan York up before and they know that Dan York lives at this address and not at either of these two, mm. they know enough to go to that, that address for you. Um, and so them being uh, vocal about some of these logistics problems you think has cost them some business? I think it has, yep. Mm. Um, I asked it right out at the last oversight meeting. I said, all of you raise your hand if you've had to lay off people since we've entered into contract with MTM. And every single one of them to, to the person have have laid off people. Well, and they've invested, I just want to tell you one more yeah. thing, and they've invested money with the promise of work. They bought handicapped accessible vans sure. that are now sitting parked well, in isn't the garage. Well, isn't, uh, all due respect, isn't the more acute question, how many of you have had a layoff employee since the investigation has begun by House Oversight? 
I think that ha it's been since the investigations have so begun. So it's not just since they've been hired, it's no. since they've been complaining about mm -hmm. the relationship and or the execution. Uh, what's the uh, what's the moral of the story and the end game here? Well, I'm again, Dan, I, all I can do is to use the bully pulpit and shine the light. And I told them at the last meeting, which was probably two or three weeks ago, that I am not waiting until January because t too much mischief can be created between May and January if they think we're not looking. So I have a sufficient number of oversight committee members who will come in. We'll have another hearing. That's all I can do, Dan, is hold their feet to the fire. That's you, all I can do. You know what? I, I, I'm just going to say this because I, I need to. Notwithstanding the job that the former chairperson of House Oversight did, our rep from Cumberland, on 38 Studios, it would have been something if at the time you were chairing House Oversight with 38 Studios investigation. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a little bit different dynamic because I do believe that the speaker soft played that on purpose. I know you are loyal to the speaker. I think the speaker is very happy with your performance. But do you ever wonder if you had been in that position at that time, whether we would have had a much more, much more aggressive, diligent exposure about what happened in the General Assembly? Dan, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm, and, and I'm always honest, painfully honest. I was a member of House Oversight when Karen Macbeth was the you, chair. But you weren't chairing it. And I wasn't chairing it. And Dan, i got to tell you, for two years we went to meetings and we reviewed emails. Honestly, that's all we did was review emails. And when the speaker asked me to take this, I took a little bit of heat from the public because, again, open mouth, insert foot, a pro-Joe reporter said, you know, now that you're chair of oversight, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pivot away from 38 Studios. I need to dig in and get to some other matters. Yeah, by the time you were there, the 38 Studios had run its course in House right. Oversight. Right. And all you did was read the doggone emails. That's there all there we was did. so much more that could have or should have been done. I just think that, uh, I think that uh, Karen did what she could, um, but the whole thing ran at, uh, at slow speed. Well, we, it was in the hands of Max Wistow. Who better than Max Wistow to well, handle? Max Wistow with the litigation. Right. Yes. Uh, he it was complicated. It it's was still complicated. complicated to and be the speaker with you. gave her the power of subpoena. I do remember Stephen Constantino coming in, coming in yeah. to testify before us one and to witness. take questions. One witness. I think he was the only one who agreed to come in. Anyway, we don't have to redig the whole That's thing. That's okay. But the general public and their attitude toward all sorts of things like public-private partnership and progress in this state have been poisoned by the lack of I accountability agree. on that on that saga. And I it agree. It will linger as a cloud and a clogged artery in our in our circulatory system politically for a long, long I'm time. I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, good work on, on this stuff. Thank uh, you. Please come back when you think you've got a little bit more of I a... Will finality of feeling about this report with DCYF and perhaps you can come here with the child advocate who's more than invited and so too is the director. I appreciate your good work. I'll Thanks, be here, Pat. Thank you. All right. Final word and we come back. Stay with us.